Hi, hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me from the theater and from uh, those who are online? Great. Perfect. It's so nice to see you. So um, this will be my very first lecture uh, here uh, for Comp 1531. I'm so excited to get started. Like I've been waiting for this day for so, so long. So um, yeah, I hope you all know me. So I'm Yu Chao. Uh, I'm an education focused associate lecturer here at CSE. Um, so my background is software engineering. So yeah, I love this course and I hope you will enjoy our journey together with me. Um, I need to start recording. Okay, cool. Perfect. So what are we going to talk about today? Mm. So we are going to talk about data interchange, also uh, a little bit about uh, continuous integration. So um, data interchange is um, one more, like another lecture about full stack. So uh, we've seen uh, before a lecture by Jake on full stack before. So let's have a look at here. So yeah. Uh, oh, this is the very first one about full stack. So what is full stack? I think it's better to start with what is full stack, right? So that we can understand why we need to talk about data interchange. Have you ever used ChatGPT? Like I've been using ChatGPT recently to um, get some brief or overview of some context and it's been helpful. So let's have a look uh, what is full stack. Oops, an error. <laughs> All right, uh, let's regenerate. No worries, I've uh, asked, asked ChatGPT before. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the chat, like after this lecture, we all become full stack developers. That's nice. Okay, I need to verify I'm a human. Okay, so what is full stack? Okay, so this is what ChatGPT gives us. So chat, uh, full stack refers to collection of technologies frameworks used to develop a web application includes both front end and back end components. Okay, so a full stack developer is someone who is proficient in both front end and back end development. Okay, so a full stack developer is knowledgeable in multiple programming languages. So, um, yeah, so this is one of the uh, answers of what is full stack. I think I asked ChatGTP before what is full stack and it kind of gave me a better answer. Uh, which is here. So a backend refers to the server set of the application and front end refers to the part of the application that users can see and interact with. So such as what we can see here is front end and the back end is the server set of the application. Okay, so this is uh, what is front end and back end and uh, full stack generally uh, refers to a developer who has the skills and knowledge to work on both front end and the back end of our web application. So talking about um, front end and back end, um, we might think of like there are uh, ways like the front end and the back end, they need to interact with each other, they need to transmit data from front end to back end. So for example, uh, when I input something here or I um, put an email address when I'm trying to log in, uh, the front end needs to transmit this information, like my email address to the back end and to verify it, right? So also uh, for front end, there are some uh, commonly used languages um, such as HTML or JavaScript, like what we learn in this course. And there are also some uh, commonly used backhand languages such as Python <laughs> and Node.js. And also JavaScript is also now um, frequently used for backhand. So, okay, look, let's come back here. So now we've got an understanding what is full stack. So what, why data interchange matters here for full stack, okay? 
Um, yeah. So um, we need a way to interchange data between uh, front end and back end, and also uh, not only front end and back end, but also maybe different software components or uh, different APIs. We need to transmit the data between them among, among them. So we are going to talk about the importance of, and why we need to talk about data interchange. And we are also going to talk about uh, some commonly used data formats. Okay, so when you see um, the, the words here, like standard interfaces, what are you thinking of? Can you put it in the chat? Like, I can give you some examples, uh, very interesting examples like Hayden put here before. So for example, the first one, a USB. Okay, so this is a um, quite straightforward example of a standard interface. So can you also come up with some other examples like when you see a standard interface, what can you think of? Okay, VS Code, yep. What else? <laughs> USB, yeah, not lightning, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this slide, um, this example is coming from like a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, cables, yeah. Cool, great, great example. CPU, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um. Yeah, HTML is an example, but there are also like not only in the field of software engineering or not only in the field of computer or uh, computer science, there are also like other examples. For example, this one, the screw, right? There needs to be a standard interface so that a screw can work well. And also HTTP, yeah. And railway track. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, so these are some examples of standard interface in your life. Um, so what do, what do all of these systems have in common? So they have a standard interface, right? So they are standard interfaces. There's a universal method of connecting different systems together, okay? Yep. So um, in the world of soft software or software engineering, uh, there's a standard, there are standard interfaces for data. Like we talk about like how we transmit data from front end to back end or back end to front end. And also transmit data uh, from APIs or different software components. We need, we also need this kind of standard interfaces. Okay, so for example, how would you share the results that are C program outputs with the JavaScript program? So the way we solve this problem is use a data interchange format. Okay, so um, when talking about data interchange formats, um, there are a couple of um, commonly used ones, uh, which include JSON, YAML, and XML. Right. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there are new, uh, perhaps they are new for you, like different. So we talked about JavaScript in uh, previous lectures in the past two weeks. And now uh, there are some new uh, data formats, but you do not need to be scared. Um, they are very easy to use, very easy to read. Um, and we are going to look at their syntax and we are going to see some examples. And um, the aim of this lecture is to introduce you to what is um, data interchange formats and give you some brief understanding of how they work. Um, so you do not need to write from scratch and be super familiar with the language. So when, um, we'll have a look at the more details later. So I just don't want you to be scared. They are very simple. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one, which is JSON. Okay, so have you seen JSON.json files before? So 
So last week, when we talk about、uh, NPM, when we download a package from NPM,、uh, have you seen a dot JSON file? Yes, 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 yes. A lot of games have that. Yes.、Um, Cool, great. So we are not very、uh, new to JSON. So let's have a look at how、uh, JSON looks like. So, what about、um, so last week I was、uh, this one. <laughs> last week when Jake was、uh, talking about how we download modules、uh, from. NPM. I was、uh, working together with,、uh, during the lecture. So this is the、um, NPM example that I have here from last week. So when we do, when we download those packages, it all automatically we can see some like package dot JSON and package、um, log JSON files. So this these are JSON files. Okay. So let's have a look at how it looks. Yeah, so、um, you may have noticed that the syntax is、uh, quite similar to JavaScript, right? So there's a reason for that.、Uh, so the full name of JSON is called JavaScript Object Notation. <laughs> Let's have a closer look at it. What is it? So it's a data interchange format, and、uh, the full name is JavaScript Object Notation. So it's a lightweight text-based language-independent data interchange format. Okay, so it's text text-based in a very lightweight. Okay, let's have a, let's come back and have a look at this example again. So、uh, you may have noticed that. Uh, the names, versions, descriptions here—they all,、um, all of them have、um, this double quote here. Okay, so let's have a try. What will happen if I remove this double quote? Okay, it says that property keys must be double quoted. So this is the syntax of JSON, just how JSON looks like.、Uh, so I'm checking your comments, your chat. <laughs> Yes, Java.、Uh, I do not. Yeah, cool. Okay. Another difference is、um, what if I remove here, so the trailing comma an error occurs. So in JavaScript,、uh, the trailing comma is optional, but in JSON, we need to have those. Okay. So this is just a very、um, this. Come back to last week to see an example of how、uh, JSON files looks like. Okay, so let's have a look at another example. Okay, so here's a, another example of how JSON files looks like. So here、uh, we are trying to store some data about、uh, locations. So we have suburb, we have postcodes. What if we have it here? Okay, an error, right? So this is the syntax of、uh, JSON files. Oops. Yeah, it's very similar to JavaScript data structure, right? Um, but there are also some differences. For example, no trailing commas a lot, as we、uh, have seen here. There's no. Trailing commas a lot here, okay. And object keys must be strings. So these are object keys. They must be strings and include the double quotes here, the apostrophes. Right. So this is the syntax of how、um, JSON looks like. It's not that scary, right? And it's very easy to read. So even though for those、uh, who are not very familiar with programming languages,、uh, the JSON files is also pretty straightforward. So it was designed actually for human-readable data interchange. Okay, and you can see. 
uh, the file's name is uh, in this format, like .json. Yep, okay, cool. Any questions to you now? Uh, checking the chat. All good. Yep, um, cool. So, yes, very easy to read is text based. It's actually some text. So, although we uh, put them in some structures like this, but it's just text. We'll see. Uh, in more details uh, in a few minutes it's just text so not be too scared um, okay so because we are using json as a data change uh, in the data interchange format so we are actually transmitting using the json file to transmit data right so to transmit data so for example um, just an example, like for example, we have something coming from front end and we need to use this data for the back end. So we might need to save this uh, JSON file uh, somewhere. So for example, we have uh, JavaScript uh, in the front end, then we need to translate into uh, JSON and save it as a JSON file. And then when the back end uh, want to use this data, it's need to read this JSON file, uh, for example, using JavaScript or using Python or whatever, and then transform, uh, transmit this JSON format into uh, JavaScript data structure or Python or whatever. Okay, so the good news is that um, most of the languages have this capability, either built in or via libraries to write or read JSON. So we do not need to uh, worry about that. So there are some libraries that we can use directly to write and read JSON from JavaScript or Python or whatever. And most of the time, these libraries, they are responsible for converting between the JavaScript data structure and a string file or text-based dump of JSON. Okay, so let's have a look at some example, like how it works. Okay, so this is what I have here. Let's ignore uh, the other parts. Just have a look at here. So this is a uh, JavaScript data structure, and um, we name this data as data structure. And we have some names, um, and we have first name, last name. Okay, so this is now in uh, JavaScript data structure. Let's console log it and see how it looks like. Okay, so console log this data structure. I've removed it for now. And um, note JSON. Yeah, so this is what we got uh, from the console log. So this is where we console logged. So we have some names here. Right, so what if we uh, want to just want to console log names? Okay, so we got the names. Okay, okay, so um, what if we want to uh, transmit this data structure into JSON format? So the syntax we use here is called json.stringify. And we can stringify this uh, JavaScript data structure. Let's comment this part for now and console lock this data and see how it looks like. Wow. <laughs> so this is what we got, <laughs> just a string, a text. So we can, can you see clearly, do you want me to make it a bit larger here? Okay, so this is what we got here. So we can see that JSON is just some uh, text, just no structure in it. So let's have a look. Uh, what if we want to console log this data and with names? Will that work? Do you think it if it would work or not? <laughs> okay, let's have a try and see. 
Yes. Oh, it says undefined. So because uh, the reason is that when we um, make it a when we string file into a JSON data format, there's actually no such kind of object or structure or whatever. It's just text. It's just this string of text. So there's no name defined here. Okay, let's try again. See? When we console log it, um, the data, the JSON format data is just a text. Okay. Cool. So now um, we've uh, transmitted this JavaScript data structure into JSON data format. So now what we want to do, um, we want to save it into a JSON file so that other uh, software components can read that JSON file and then transmit that JSON files into whatever data format that we want. Okay, so uh, to write this data, uh, JSON file, uh, the syntax uh, the library we use is called write uh, file sync. Okay, so this is what we use. And it's, it comes from uh, this library, it's called FS. Uh, we do not need to worry too much about this library as well, so it's part of Node.js. Okay, so it's uh, already built in library from Node.js. So, yeah, let's have a try. Um, so before we export uh, this data to export JSON, uh, let's have a look at what, doc, uh, what are the files that I have now in this folder. So I have some JS files. We have uh, the node module. We have the package uh, JSON file, package JSON, and also this readme file. Okay, so let's have a look what happens uh, after I run this. Okay, so let's list all the files again. So you will see that there's one more file, one more uh, JSON file. So add it. So it's, it comes from here. So we write to the file called export JSON. And we write in this file the data that we have here. And the syntax here, the third part is just a flag with write. We are writing now. Okay, so this is just the syntax. Okay. Uh, in the chat, uh, it asks, you're asking about what happens if you run it again. Okay, cool. Let's try run it again. Yep, yeah, and let's list all those here. <laughs> There's no additional export.json files added. Okay, it's just write to that again. So let's have a try. So what if we want to write something different to this export.json file? So for example, oops, what I want to write here is, uh, oh, before we do that, let's have a look what's inside this export.json file. So what's in it? Okay, so let's open it. Oh, yes, it's here is the text, <laughs> the JSON format text, like what we have seen in the terminal before here. So we write this text, this JSON format text into this JSON file. So this is how it works for the rights. Okay. Let me check the, uh, the chat in, see if any questions. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> we have wonderful tutors in the chat and answer the questions pretty well, so which is great. So let's have uh, another look. So what if uh, I want to do something different? So I used to write this data uh, to this export JSON file. So I changed that. So what if I want to write something like, hello, comp1531. Let's run that again and see what we have got now in this export JSON file. Yes, it has hello comp1531, but it's an error message because it's not properly formatted in uh, JSON format. The syntax is not properly. 
but um, at least we can get an understanding of what is happening here in uh, oops, here uh, right to JSON files. Okay, so let's any unsolved questions in the chat? Yeah. Oh, our great tutor. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. I think we can move on now. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, so now we've discussed about writing files. Now let's have a look at how we read JSON files and uh, put it in a, a JavaScript uh, data structure. Let's have another look. I've prepared a code here. <laughs> so you can have a look. So this is how we uh, read JSON files. Okay, so let's... Um, so this is the syntax that we use for reading files from JSON. So what is happening here is we read from this export.json file and we flag it as a read. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you have, so let, no, let's just have a look directly. So what if we console log it? Let's see what happens. Okay, so we read from this export JSON file and we uh, save this, the data, the information in this uh, JSON and we console log this JSON and see what it happens. Okay. Oops, <laughs> yeah, the buffer issue. So if you have viewed um, the 1531 lecture recording from previous years, so you might have seen this, but it's not a big deal. We can, um, so the reason that is not what we are except, uh, expected, like the names, uh, instead we got these numbers because of the buff buffering. It's just how uh, the system save data and um, put the data in specific formats. So let's instead uh, do this. Okay, but it's actually doing the same. So the reason that I'm um, changing it to here because uh, we want to console log JSON and view this uh, JSON data in the terminal. Okay, oops, it's COM1531. Did we save this data here? No, we didn't save it, it's still here. So I need to pull this data back. Okay, cool. Now when we uh, run this file and we console log this JSON, this is what we get. Okay, so this is how we read uh, data from uh, JSON files. Okay, but it's not uh, properly formatted. It's not in what we are expected. Like we are looking for uh, getting some data from JSON file and putting the data structure in the format of JavaScript, right? So that we can use those data in um, the JavaScript data format. Okay, so what we do is use another um, function called json.pass. So it helps us to format this JSON file, uh, JSON data. So no longer it looks like the text here. We want to have some format. Right, so this is what we want. Okay, so let's have a try and see how it works. Okay, comment this one. What we just want is read from this file and we put in the JavaScript data structure, the data format, and then we console log this data, this well-formatted data. So this is what we expected. So let's have a try, see it works as we expected. Yay, <laughs> this is what we console log. Right. Um, Yes, quite straightforward. So you don't need to worry too much about these uh, these functions. Uh, they are just building libraries that we can call them directly. Okay. Any questions from the chat? 
Does JSON dot parse reformat the JSON file? <laughs> yeah, we've already got an answer in the chat. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have now uh, have a look at how JSON files looks like and how we can read and write from JSON file and transmit the data formats from JavaScript to JSON and from JSON to JavaScript. Hey, cool. Shall we uh, wait a few minutes or shall we move on? Are you all clear to you now? So do you understand like why we uh, have JSON? <laughs> because it's a data interchange format, right? As we mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. So it helps us to um, communicate between different uh, the, uh, software components or um, APS or whatever, it helps us to communicate. Otherwise, different data structure, they cannot uh, communicate well. And JSON is quite easy. So it's just a way of stor uh, storing data. Okay, so it's not a programming language. It's not. So let's have a look at here. So this is a JSON file. It's in the uh, JSON data format, right? So it's not doing any programming or whatever functions like that. It's just a way of storing data. It helps... Um, the different software components to communicate because it's kind of uh, a way of uh, storing data, like in the middle, that it can easily communicate with uh, different languages. Okay, so it's just a way of storing data. Yep. Cool. Great. Uh, the chat looks fine. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this is JSON. Let me see if I've missed anything. Yep, should be fine. Um, cool. So this is the slide. It's just doing what I've been talking about, like uh, read file, uh, write to JSON file and read from JSON file and um, JSON pass. Okay, uh, so you can get a code from the slides. Okay, so <laughs> so here's YAML. So uh, at the beginning, like we talk about, like there are multiple different uh, formats. It in their main interchange uh, formats, and we now talk about JSON. And we still have YAML and XML to talk about. So YAML, um, have you seen any YAML files before? So uh, it looks like .yml or .yaml. Have you seen any YAML files? No? <laughs> Okay, cool. So um, YAML file, no, oh, never. <laughs> so we are going to talk a little bit about that. So it looks a little bit easy, like more easy to read, like easier to read, even comparing with JSON file. So uh, let's have a look how we had the same information in JSON file. It's here, the locations, right? So this is how we compare, like there are, storing the same data, the locations, right? But just in different format, different syntax, right? And we can see that YAML file is a lot more condensed. It's even easier to read. Okay, so this is YAML. So when, um, we will talk a little bit more after this lecture actually about YAML because we are going to use it for uh, continuous inter. Uh, integration for configuration okay but for now we just have a look at how it looks like and um another, th another thing is that um the indentation matters so there are some to help you use uh yaml so there are some uh available yeah, this is called YAML check. There are multiple YAML validators online that it can help you validate your YAML data. 
So for example, let's have a try this one. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is just copy and pass it here. And let's simply like ch check. Yes, valid YAML. So, so what if I change a little bit here? Oops, an error message. <clears throat> because the reason for this error message is that in YAML, uh, the indentation matters. So we need to have proper indentation here. Okay, and we can also add some other stuff like um, another postcode. <laughs> I don't know what to add. <laughs> Just 2033 and go, oops. <laughs> What is wrong here? Oh, I need to have it here. It looks like this. Yes, yeah, Valley YAML. So the adaptation does matter here in YAML. Okay, so this is the syntax of YAML. Um, yeah, anything else that I want to talk about YAML? Uh, what about this one? <laughs> JSON to YAML. So there are a lot of different services online that I can help you convert. Uh, JSON to YAML and YAML to JSON. They are very similar, but we can see that YAML files is uh, quite, straight, uh, quite straightforward, it's quite easy to read and easy to write as well. Um, and for the same time, you also do not need to worry too much about uh, them um, because there are a lot of services like this kind of tools online to help you validate uh, and tell you where are the errors. Okay, different formats designed for different uses. Yes, you're right. And um, yes, we are going to, uh, like we have seen when we use JSON, right? So uh, in the NPM packages that uh, we have seen earlier, it used JSON. Uh, and we're also going to see uh, when we are going to use YAML uh, in the second lecture today, okay? Uh, but for now, let's just simply have a look at um, a syntax. Okay, so YAML is uh, very commonly used for configurations. Okay, and a dash is used to begin a list atom. Okay, so this is YAML. Yeah, uh, the chest has been good. Okay, so the last one, the last uh, commonly used data interchange format is called XML. Um, it's quite often used in um, our web applications. Um, although it's uh, a little bit old school, like old fashioned, a lot of extra information here. So some of the, uh, like people, when they first have a look at XML format, a little bit confused, like, oh, what are they? like? <laughs> Yes, but um, yeah, uh, I know um, if you have a choice, like many of you may not choose to use that XML, um, but it's still uh, quite commonly used to data interchange format. Like um, this time I'm also teaching another second year uh, software engineering course. And in that course, we use XML. <laughs> uh, as a way of structuring and storing data. Um, and this is how XML looks like. Um, but for now in Comp3, uh, 1531, you do not need to worry too much about that. You just need to know, well, this is another um, data interchange format. And when you download any package or you won't see any XML code uh, from any open source libraries or whatever, you, you do not need to be scared. Like you can, know that it's just a, a way of storing data. It's a data interchange format, okay? So there are some use cases of XML. So um, for example, uh, let's have a look uh, here. Yes, ChatGPT again. So <laughs> I asked the ChatGPT uh, to provide me an example of an E invoice XML file. So there are some, so E invoice is uh, like 
um, a way of sending invoice uh, through uh, web services. Okay, so invoice is commonly used XML as a, a way of storing the in invoice data. So they use XML. And there are also other uh, yeah, let's have, let me have a look. Cool. Yeah, the chat has been fine, which is great. So this is how XML looks like. And I know it's a little bit complicated. It looks like at a first glance, but it's still text. It's the same with um, JSON or YAML, it's just text, okay? Cool, what else I need to make? Yeah, some issues with XML include it's a little bit more verbose. It's harder to read at a glance. And it's also a little bit more demanding to precise or interpret and more best required to store, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, you will find very few modern applications to use XML, um, but it's still commonly used. It's um, traditional way. I, I don't know whether it's probably to say that, but it's still very uh, commonly used. So when you see S XML, well, XML, well, you know it's a way of storing data. It's just a, a data interchange format. Yes, yeah, heavier, definitely, yes. Cool. So this is uh, about what is data interchange. So the aim of this lecture is to introduce you to what is data interchange formats. Um, so in this course from, I think from week, uh, let me double check, from week five, uh, no, uh, in tutorial five and in lab uh, three, the academics, you will uh, get exposed to JSON and YAML. So you will be using JSON and YAML in this course, uh, in our tutorials and in our labs. Uh, we are also going to use YAML uh, in our second lecture today. Uh, when we talk about data interchange, we use uh, .yml. So YAML files as a way, uh, as uh, to for configurations. <clears throat> Did you say week five? Uh, tutorial five. Yes, tutorial five is in week five. Yes, yes. And also lapse rate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. What data do we normally interchange? All data in our program or just some important ones? It depends on what what data you want to um, transmit from different software components. Uh, so you do not need to transform all data. It just depends on what you want to transmit. Okay. Um, it's also a way of storing data. So for example, when we look at the, uh, the example from last week, uh, the NPM modules, like when we download the NPM package, uh, there's the .json file, the package JSON file. It's used to store the important information about uh, what this package is about and some version name, uh, brief description, and also the author lessons and dependencies. Okay, it's it tells the user like what 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 are the main information from uh, some important data that you about this uh, package. Yep. Uh, what else in the chat? Cool, great. Um, looks well in the chat. Um, but if I or we have missed any questions, or uh, we have missed any question, like me, myself and our tutors uh, missed, you can also post that question on forum after the lecture. 
uh, we'll get to that as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, oh, in the chat we are talking about CNCD. <laughs> we are going to talk about it a little bit later today about CI and CD. Cool. Um, great. So let's have 10 minutes rest. A little bit. Is ChatGPT a lot for this course? It depends on how you use that. Uh, if you are using that, um, try to put a reference like you or a setting your uh, somewhere in your project like you use the ChatGPT for what. Uh, I don't think we are forbidden. Like we are not. We can't say that we do not allow you to use ChatGPT because sometimes ChatGPT can be helpful. Like for example, when we ask ChatGPT to provide me an example of XML. Uh, is actually a pretty good example. Uh, however, uh, you need to be mindful when you are using ChatGPT. So for example, um, I asked ChatGPT twice, like what is full stack? <laughs> and the first answer, like the first time when I asked what is full stack, the answer is quite good. However, the second time, uh, I think the answer is not that clear. It's not that good. So. You need to be mindful when you're using ChatGPT. <laughs> Stack all full of labs, yes, I know. Yep, okay, cool. So 10 minutes rest and uh, we'll come back at um, 10.55, okay. All right, uh, I will see you at I'll put in the chat 1055. Uh, okay. See you soon. Have a rise. <laughs> 1057. Okay, sure.
Um, hey, I'm back. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. Like, hi, Ming. Wong is asking a question. Um, unfortunately, I also didn't get your question. So, uh, you can try to uh, post in the forum. Otherwise, you can also uh, just make sure that make your question clear so that we can answer you properly. Okay. Hello, welcome back. So it's ten fifty-seven. Yep. Um. Cool. Great. I hope you all had a good rest. Um. Can you hear me from online and in the theater? Yes. Okay. Cool. Great. Great. So let's move on to our next topic, uh, which is continuing continuous integration. Okay. Um, so this is part of the project lecture. So let's again have a look at uh, our lectures. So here we are at here the projects. So we've talked a little bit about projects before on the pro uh, package management, like NPM. Okay, so this is the second lecture about projects. Okay. So um, it's about like how we manage our projects. Um, yeah, so we are going to talk about why we need uh, to have continuous uh, continuous integration and what is continuous integration, how uh, we use continuous integration. Okay, we're also going to talk a little bit about pipelines and runners. Okay, so how, how are you going on with your projects? So this, is, this lecture is about projects. So. Uh, you're all working in groups on your projects, right? So uh, I do a lot of 
merge, uh, commit, push, a lot of that. Yeah, and how is the collaboration going on? Good. Cool. So, um, yeah, um, in the past, like developers, they, uh, they met work in isolation for quite extended period for quite a long time, like individually. And they, uh, when they think they have completed code, completed their feature, and they push it to the, to the main branch. So this is what people used to do um, before in the past. Um, but this may cause a lot of issues. So for example, um, there may be bugs <laughs> or um, there may be something wrong like it's not compatible with uh, some, like the, the calls from somebody else. So, and the issue may accumulate for a long period of time without correct, uh, correction. And this may make it harder uh, to deliver updates uh, quickly to the customers. So this is a kind of background, like before continuous integration uh, was introduced. Like people working in isolation uh, by themselves for quite a long time and then push a, a box set of code <laughs> into the main uh, branch. And yeah, so this is kind of background and the issue. So um, continuous integration is actually a kind of practice okay so it's uh it's a very good practice of um, mer um like software engineers or developers they regularly merge their code changes to a central repository so merge regularly merge early merge often and check uh for issues check for bugs uh often so that the issues will not accumulate uh, so they can find the problems early and often so that it can solve the issues. Okay, so continuous integration uh, in simple words is a kind of practice that the developers integrate their code changes early and often to the main branch or code repository. Okay, and the goal is to reduce the risk of waiting uh, for the end of uh, the deadline, like waiting for the deadline and everyone's pushing their code and merge it work together. Uh, so to reduce this risk of waiting at the end and to find and address bugs quickly and imp so that they can improve the software quality and it's also reduced the time to validate um, and release the new software updates to the customers. Okay, so actually continuous integration is a part of, uh, it's a practice part of DevOps <laughs> or Agile, if you have heard that um, before, but you do not need to care, um, worry too much about that at this stage. Okay, so without continuous integration, so previously, the developer collaboration is a tedious manual process especially in a quite large uh, team. So for example, um, the commonly used example is uh, in software uh, development companies like Canva or YouTube or Netflix. So there are a lot of developers. So collaborations can be a big issue if they do not uh, follow continuous integration uh, practices. Okay. So this is kind of a background, like why this is important. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. So let's have a look at the slides. So um, to achieve continuous integration, um, there are a couple of things that we need to do to achieve this goal. Okay. Um, and when we talk about merge, uh, when we talk about branches, when we talk about commit, uh, we think about like what? <laughs> version control systems, right, such as Git. Right, so Git can help us, um, the Git systems or version control systems can help us with the continuous integration process as a practices, okay? So, yeah, so how does continuous integration works? So prior to each commit, uh, before each commit, developers may choose to run some local tests on their code before they merge to the main branch to make sure there's less bugs and less issues and cause less problem to the main uh, project. 
Okay, and there are a couple of continuous integration services. So there are some services uh, that automatically builds and runs this test for you so that you do not need to run those tests uh, on your own belt of in the terminal or whatever each time. And they automatically run those tests for you. So these are the continuous integration services and they can help you with uh, the test. And so that you can find uh, the errors uh, immediately. Okay, before you push to the main branch. Okay, so um, there are a lot of uh, very good resources or services online about like how we do continuous integration. Um, yeah, so here is one that I found pretty useful. You can ignore all those stuff. Okay, so too much information. You do not need to worry about that. So. Just to summarize, so here is a very good summarization of uh, how to set up continuous integration. Um, there are five main steps. I'll make it a little bit bigger here. Okay, so start writing tests for critical parts of your code base. Okay, and get a continuous integration service. So get a service to run those tests automatically on every push to the main repository. Okay, make sure that your team integrates their changes every day or even multiple times a day. Okay, so and fix the builds as soon as it's broken. I will explain more about here, like how we fix the build and what it means to fix the builds. And also write tests for every new story that you implement. It sounds a little bit complete for you now, so you don't need to worry about that as well. So, um, just to summarize that you, um, commit um, often and regularly and get some continuous integration service to help you run those tags automatically. So this is just how we uh, set up continuous integration. Yes, I found in the chat, like uh, you mentioned that I think GitLab have CI features within. Yes, you're right. So we are going to talk more about that. Cool, great. So there are a couple of different uh, continuous integration services. Uh, and also a couple of tools, like commonly used tools. Um, so here are some tools. So for example, Bitbucket, it offers some pipelines, some services that can help you with Windows tests. And there are also some other ones. So for example, the one from AWS, uh, this one, this one. Yes, GitLab is here. So GitLab also offers this uh, continuous integration service for you and it's built in. Okay, so they can, GitLab can help you automatically run those tags for you and check for you, which is great. <laughs> uh, there are also other tools. So in this course, we will be mainly using uh, the tool from GitLab. Okay, but if you are interested in learning more about others, you can also have a look at uh, the, the one from AWS and the one from Bitbucket. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, Oh, have you used Jake's account? So you can see that Jake sent a message, a link here. Okay, so if you want to learn more about how to set up continuous integration, you can also have a look at the link here. But we do not concern much about these details in this course, okay? You just need to have a, a very brief understanding of what is continuous integration and the continuous integration service, like how we use them. Okay. Cool. Um, yes, and in continuous integration, there's a series of operations. Uh, for example, we have building, we have testing, and more that we will explain in the future. And now we are mainly uh, concerning about um, testing. Okay, so how continuous integration can help us test before we push to the main uh, branch. Okay. Okay, so to oversimplify, <laughs> continuous integration allows us to automatically run the NPM run test and more and others, of course, on every commit. And it's automatically run on every commit. Okay, and we can also get a visual whether it's okay or not okay summary of this on GitLab. Okay, let's have a look at how it works. So let me open my GitLab. So this is my uh, 
you can see here. So I add myself as a, as a subgroup uh, of project in comp one of three one. So I have let's create a new project perhaps. Is setting up CI recommended <laughs> optional for now? Yes, you're right. Um, only for now, but in the future, we um, we need to have uh, CI uh, setups. Okay, so let's create a new project. Uh, you do not need to do that for your project, um, but for not just to explain. So uh, my awesome project, perhaps. No. Uh, what's my project name? So three point two lecture. Okay, CA create project. So if you have a laptop now, you can also do this with me. So you can try to create a blank project, but make sure that you create this project within. Comp one five three one. I I will explain later why. Okay, so not awesome project anymore. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure that I, I can find that easier in the future. But you can use whatever project name uh, you like. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's create this project. Okay. So this is a project with only one file in the repo, which is the readme file. Okay, so you might have seen it here before in the left hand side and the menu is a CI slash CD. Okay, so CI means continuous integration and CD is continuous uh, deployment. Um, but uh, let's focus on CI at the moment. Okay, so let's click on it and you can see there are uh, four step uh, menus here, which are pipeline. Yes, a new term called pipelines. <laughs> Editor, jobs, and schedules. Okay. Um, yeah, so GitLab uh, CICD tool uh, or the service or CICD service is very good, I think. Uh, it's also provide a very um, easier to understand UI or UX. Um, let's skip pipelines for now. I will come back to it later. Let's go to editors, editor now. Okay, so what it says here is optimize your workflow with CI slash CD pipelines. Create a new, yes, YAML file. <laughs> we talked a little bit earlier today about YAML file. Now we are going to use that, okay, for our CI CD pipelines okay and this file uh, we need to name it as dot gitlab slash ci dot yaml and gitlab will find this file in your repo okay remember to use so i will use the editor from gitlab for now because it's quite straightforward and um is I, I will do the lazy, lazy steps. Okay, so see how GitLab pipelines work. So this GitLab CI larger, this GitLab CI YAML file creates a simple test pipeline. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, cool. So here's a template, a template uh, YAML file for CI. Can we use JSON instead? No. <laughs> Um, we can't, unfortunately. We need to use this YAML file for GitLab CI/CD service. Okay, so this file is a template. I want it a little bit bigger. Okay, I might need editing before it works on your projects. Okay, so this is a sample GitLab CI/CD configuration file that should run without any modifications. That's fine. So now it explains what is a pipeline. Okay, attention please. <laughs> pipeline is composed of independent jobs that run scripts grouped into stages. Okay. So a couple of terms here, pipeline. Okay, so pipeline is just uh, some jobs. Okay, some independent jobs composed of this pipeline. 
Okay, and these jobs, what does these jobs do? These jobs run the scripts, and these scripts are grouped into stages. Okay, stages run in sequential, sequential, sequential order, but jobs with stages run in parallel. Okay, a little bit complex here, but we, let's have a look at below here, so we can see. Yeah, stages. So in this example, uh, we have three stages. So this are uh, this is the list of stages for the jobs and their order of execution. Okay, so they will run uh, the build first as the first stage. After the build, we will run the test and then deploy. So this. These are listed in the order. So after they finish the first stage, it can go to the second and then the third. Okay, so you can have more for office. It really depends on like how many stages you define in your pipeline. Okay, and um, below are some drops. Okay, so all of these are drops. Okay. And in each job, it describes which stage is it belongs to. So for example, this build job, it belongs to the stage of build. Okay, the stage here. And the second one, it belongs to the stage of test. Okay, and the third, uh, this one is also belongs to the test. Okay, and these two jobs, they are all in, they both in this stage test and they run in parallel. Okay, it's not they finish this first test job and then do the second test job, it's not. They do them in parallel. Okay. Um, yes, it's just a template. Uh, let's make it a little bit uh, simpler. Uh, I'll remove those, 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 those. So I remove all the stages and only leave one. Okay, I only leave this stage called build. And what I run in this build job is I just print out something. Hello, comp, comp, <laughs> comp, 1531, smiling face. Okay, so this is what I do in this table. I only have one stage and this stage only have one job. Okay, so now let's commit the changes and see what happens. Uh, before I commit a change. Okay, let's commit a change. Yay, your change have been successfully committed and it's not checking pipeline status. Okay, and GitLab, oh, <laughs> like this is the tick. So it means that the pipeline has passed, meaning that this automatic test has passed because there's nothing it's not actually testing anything but it's just an example to show you uh what happens um for this uh service gitlab ci service okay so this uh gitlab tool is quite good that it helps you uh, to check whether your pipeline syntax is correct okay so let's play around so i'll remove this for now Okay, so that you can have everything here, so it's easy to read. Uh, what I'm going to do is have you make it looks like this. Okay, <laughs> so you can see now, like this GitLab CI configuration is invalid. Okay, so it helps you check your syntax, check your YAML uh, file syntax, which is great. So you do not need to worry too much about that. It checks for you. Now the pipeline syntax is correct, right? Oh, Hayden is here. Hello, Hayden. <laughs> cool. So it's very good. It helps you check your pipeline. And now it shows that pipeline has passed. Okay, so let's have a... So I've changed this file, so I need to commit it. And we'll check this pipeline status again. Checking, checking. It's running. So you can see the status here. It's in progress and it's running. So it shows the state. So let's click on it and see what's inside. Now it's passed. Right? We can see 
the take, the green take is passed, which means that uh, no issue found. Okay, um, so this is uh, the UI, so the interface for the pipeline. So there are two pipelines here um, because I committed two drops before. So the first time I updated the CI, uh, the YAML file, uh, and it checked uh, my commit. And then I had another drop, uh, and it checked again, and it passed again. Okay, so the stages uh, is called build, and it's passed. So let's play with it a little bit. So what if I change this name as check? And this uh, needs to belong to one of the stages, so it needs to be check. Okay, the pipeline syntax is correct. Okay, so let's commit that change again. And let's go to this pipeline. Okay, it's pending, it's in progress. Okay, let's click on it. And the name has changed here. So we used to have build because the name of the stage I named it as build, but now I change it to check. And this called oops is green tick. It has passed, which is great. So let's play with it a, a little bit more. Let's add one more stage, which I call it build. Just randomly, whatever you call it. Um, so I need to. Uh, check job and then I copy and paste and this is build job and the stage in build okay so now I have two stages and in each stage I have one job let's commit that change and see what happens checking pipeline stages pipeline syntax is correct okay so let's click on the pipeline it's running again and now I have two stages. One is check, one is build. And in each stage, I have one job, which is check job and build job. So the check, job, check job now is in green tick, so meaning that is uh, passed. And now the second, so remembering that the stages, they run uh, in uh, one by one. So after the check uh, finished, then they run the build uh, stage, right? Any questions about the CICD pipelines now? All good? Is it clear? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is add jobs to check and add job to build. Okay, and see what happens. So uh, check job one in stage check and add another Oops, looks the in the same text. Check job two, I need to remove and also in stage check. Okay, so there are now two jobs in check stage and one job in build stage. Okay, so let's commit the change and see what happens. It's checking and then let's have a look at the pipeline. Oops, I click on the Let's click here, and now you can see that there are two jobs in check and one job in build. You can check job one, check job two, and this one is oh, all passed, which is great. Okay, let me let me check the chat. You don't want your <laughs> yes, which is. Good. Totally cry like you don't want your group to merge a function that doesn't pass the test exactly. So this can work on different branches before merge. Yes. So let's have another look. So for example, uh, in this repo now I have two files which is readme and GitLab CI. So what if I add a new file? Uh, file name I just call it add.js and what I do here is console log uh, hi week three are we yes we are now week three yes okay so I just commit changes directly here okay add uh, 
at dot js file commit changes okay so uh let's have a look at ci cd pipeline here right there's a new uh new pipeline here in the ci and the reason is that i add a new file in the repo I add a new file at js okay and i committed it it automatically triggers the pipeline okay see that i add add at js file it triggers this pipeline so it automatically run the test for you okay Uh, in the chat, so if it runs parallel, it will show two jobs. Yes, sometimes, yes, it will uh, show two jobs. So, for example, I commit uh, two changes, to, like, for example, add two uh, files in this repo, and I commit them together, like I push them together. Uh, it will show two jobs here, like two pipelines here. What would make a pipeline fail? <laughs> it depends on what you put in the pipeline. So for now, what we have here is just like print out something. So it doesn't really um, do any testing. Okay. But last week, uh, when Jake was talking about jazz test, right? Uh, do you remember the black box test? Yeah. Yes, the jazz test. Like you can put. Um, so if you have a JS test file in a repo, uh, you can put something like uh, npm uh, run test. Okay, so the same like when we uh, npm run test in your terminal. So it will automatically run that npm run test for you. Okay, so if your code doesn't pass that JS test, it will fail. Um, Let's have a look at like how fails looks like, okay? But I'm not going to make it too complex. Um, okay, so what, what, what about we just, I do not, have, so in this repo, uh, sorry, I'm not changed for now. So in this repo, there's no test. there's no actual code here, okay? So in this repo, um, so what if I simply, npm run test it won't work okay it will definitely not work because there's nothing in that in this repo i just put npm run test just showing you what it looks like when you fail the test okay so commit changes your change has been committed and then we will check in pipeline status okay let's go to this pipeline it's running it's in progress let's click on it oh it even passed oh yes because in these two jobs we only print out something but for build <laughs> it's running it's trying to do the npm run test oh it's failed right it failed because i have nothing in this repo but i try to run the APM, npm run test it won't work Okay, so let's click on it. You can show it shows you more details here. It tells you what what it what they are doing. Okay, and how long it took to do everything. So, for example, preparing this. Oh, uh, let's ignore this for this woman. Okay. Uh, yes. Error. <laughs> Missing script. We we do not have the jazz test in the script. It doesn't. It won't work. It just I'm showing you how it looks like when you fail a job, and there's no green take anymore in this repo. Okay. It also demonstrated here. It didn't work. It failed. Okay. So in the chat, what is the difference between check and the build stages in this? Nothing different. Yes, you are right. So nothing different. Just how I name it. Okay. So there's. It's just an example, so there's no meaning in it. You can name it anything like uh, check, check, <laughs> or whatever. So you can I remove this one a bit, make it check, check. It's just how you name it. But but um, when in real scenarios, like when you are writing the real pipelines, 
you need you try to make the name of the stages and the name of the jobs make sense, like have some meanings. Okay, but it's just how you name it. Okay, can you explain what a stage is? Yes, so stage is like how the tablet. So there are multiple stages in the pipeline. So meaning that in the um, when they run the C, um, the pep, um, so pipelines are composed of several stages and stages are composed of uh, drops, right? So they run the first stage drops first and then run the second stage drop. So this, uh, the order of the stages uh, is also, um, it's the order of their execution. Yeah, this comment here is great. So they are not running in parallel, they run one by one. So after they run this check check stage, they go to this build stage. Yes, echo is just print to terminal. Yes, yeah, so like console log is used for, it's a JavaScript print. So in C you use others, right? You familiar with C and now you're moving to JavaScript, you know, they use different syntax for print, right? So echo is here also, it's just print. <laughs> Yeah, what kind of stages would you have in your real world? Oh, cool, great. That's a good exam, a good question. Okay, so in real scenarios, so let's have a look at one. Shall I? Shall we make it a little bit complex or not? Um, no, let's not make it complex for now. So perhaps at this stage, um, only have uh, something like check. Uh, you do the test, okay, do the JS test for now and do not make it too complex, but you can make it a little bit uh, more complex in the later. But I can show you, um, let me show you here. So this is from GitLab Docs, okay, and this is about CICD and this this <laughs> is it too complex and are you overwhelmed by the information here uh just to make it a little bit sing <laughs> um so this part is about continuous integration uh, we we have build and we have test and in the future we also have deploy okay uh but i think in javascript we don't have build right uh this is my understanding, but in we mainly do test. Okay. Uh, I barely get it so far. So yeah, so the scope of each stage is separate. Um, yes, yeah, because the stages, they uh, run in sequential. So they run the first stage, they run the second, they run the third. So if you do not want to make your test in parallel, you want to do the first and then do the next later after the first finish, then you can put them, uh, group them in stages. Otherwise you can also put them in one stage, but as different jobs and you run the test in parallel. Yes, a lot of information. I know I will close this. <laughs> Let's not concern with that. Let's just have a look at here, like how we run CICD pipeline. Okay, I'm like 80% okay with this bit, only 30%. First half, which, which, which part? <laughs> Okay, so for now, um, first half, which half, first half? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mentioned first half because I got a question from the chat. Uh, you're asking like, you don't get a first half, so. Oh, you are talking about YAML and XML <laughs> and watch chat too much. 
Okay, so um, I think we can have some time left. So we can go back and recap uh, the data interchange formats like YAML or XML a bit later. But now let's focus on this uh, continuous integration. Okay. Cool. So do, re do you understand like why we need to have continuous integration? Okay, so continuous integration is a, um, like a set of practices that how we collaborate in a team. Uh, we use like version control services like GitLab. Uh, we push, uh, yeah, we regularly merge our code and integrate our code early and often. And to make sure that we can do this regularly and do not make the com uh, the process too complicated. Uh, we introduced this uh, service from GitLab. It's called CICD pipeline. It helps us to merge often because it automatically run those tags for us. Okay, so we do not need to run the terminal like an npm um, run test every time we commit something. So this service help automatically help us to test. So if there's any issue. Okay, so this is very important. Um, we are going to do some practice in the lab and also in the project. So if you are a little bit confused now, it should be fine. But the most important thing that you need to get from this lecture is that make sure that you always have this green tick here. Okay, meaning the test passed the pipeline passed. You do not want it fail, then you push it to the main and make the project uh, mess up. All right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and this is how we, so, th so this is an example, like we have stages, we have check drops, uh, or just drops, okay? Um, yeah, what does it mean if your pipeline fails? Meaning that the check fails. <laughs> so what we do in this, uh, in, YAM, in the GitLab CI YAML file is we check. So for example, we, uh, we put NPM. So do you remember last week when we talk about just test. We used npm npm run test in terminal, right? Instead of here in this YAML file, and we manually run this uh, npm run test in the terminal, right? So what this, oops, what we do here is that this CS service automatically run this npm run test for every commit we make. So that we do not need to manually run this npm run test each time we commit something. Okay, and this GitLab also uh, helps us with this visual tools. So we can have a look at like uh, at which part passed and which job didn't pass. So for example, if we have failed here. Okay. Yeah, so if you fail the pipeline, you need to fix your code before you're merging it. That's totally right, absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Take a deep breath and let's continue. Hope not too much information for you. Okay. Cool. Um, let's go back to the slide. Oh, this is here. Yes, this we have already shown it, but we used uh, another example, another template from GitLab. So yeah, we have already seen this. The most important part here is the green tick. Yeah, we, are, we are want our uh, project always have this green tick, okay, before you merge to the main. And we also look at this pipeline, like how it works which is great. Okay, so 
behind the scene how it works. <laughs> yeah, um, I hope it's not overwhelming for you, but you do not need to worry too much about that. The key here is that uh, when the commit is pushed, it's all of the code that commit is taken by another com uh, computer, which is called runner. And it has this YAML file instructions on running. Okay, so, so this is the runner. So we have this runner CSE in, in K70 building. So you do not need to worry about that. So as long as your code is in our comp 1531 repo, in that uh, big folder in that repo, uh, we already have this runner set up for you. So all you need is to uh, check if your PEP1 uh, works, like whether it passed or not, whether your PEP1 passed. Okay, you do not need to worry too much about this runner. Okay, just to briefly introduce you how it works behind the scene. So there's a runner. Yeah, so the runner is in, uh, in CSE, so you do not need to worry about that. Okay, so the runner is just another com computer and it runs the pipelines. So sometimes you may uh, see here. Sometimes you have seen failed, you have seen pass, so sometimes it will be pending. It will show as pending. Okay, so when they show pending, uh, when you click on it, uh, you will see more information like uh, your pipeline is waiting to be picked up by a runner. So for example, the runner is not free at that time when you uh, run this pipeline. So it's pending. So it's waiting to be picked up by a runner. Okay, so you when, when you see that message, you know like one uh, you know why it's showing that, so do not need to worry too much about that. Maybe the runner is just full and you just need to wait for a few minutes, okay? And um, as long as you push within this COMP1531 repo on GitLab, uh, there's a runner to help you run those uh, pipelines. You do not need to worry too much about that. Um, when I was preparing for this lecture, I was trying to have a test in my personal repo uh, and it failed. <laughs> the pipeline failed and the reason it gave me um, it no longer shows here, but the reason it showed me is there's no runner uh, for me to run the pipeline. But as long as you work in this comp 1531 repo on GitLab, there's already runner set up for you. Okay, so if you uh, practice with this within your personal GitLab for that personal GitLab repo, and it doesn't, the pipeline failed again and again, shows that there's no runner set up. So you do not need to worry too much about that. You just do your practice within the comp 1531 repo and that'll be fine. Okay. Oh, I don't need, I don't want to confuse you too much. So, yeah, so here's a summary. So continuous integration assists us in making frequent code changes because it's run the automatic task for us for each commit. Okay. And each commit triggers a pipeline. And each pipeline is made up of several stages composed with the drops. Okay. All good now. Yes, none of today's lecture is for iteration one. So today's lecture, uh, either the first half or the second half uh, is about iteration two from week five. Yeah, and uh, we also have some lab uh, practice on this contents next week, so week four. Yes, you are right. So should we only merge commits if yes, you are right. Right, but to write iteration one, test don't, it's optional. 
So you can have pad plan for your iteration one test, but it's not required. But it can be helpful for you to practice. Yes. Okay, so the key here is make sure we have this green tick. So this is the main in info that you should have. Uh, where, where's my, it's not here. Yeah, so the main, the key here is that remember you need to have this green tick here. Mm -hmm. Cool, great. So what else? Yes, so this is a figure showing how the process of continuous integration is. So we start coding, we merge, we build, we test, we report, and we release. Okay, and continuous in integration um, is a practice, as we mentioned earlier, it's a practice, it's a good practice that we more, uh, merge often and uh, regularly. Um, we integrate our code uh, to the main branch or code repository as soon, like early and often, so that we can find issues um, before we have a batch set. Uh, we have a lot of new code. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've seen the test about linting, building, testing, deploying. So we are talking about more about that later. Okay, so you do not need to concern much about that for now. Otherwise, I'm afraid I have too much information for you today. Okay, so an important rule to follow is that your master branch should always be green. No code should be merged into it unless you're getting the green tick. Okay, so this is the key information that you should leave with uh, after this lecture. <laughs> your brain. Um, Yes, let's do a quick recap uh, of summary, summary of what we covered uh, for the second half. And if we have time left, we can go back to the first half. And there's actually not too much information. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first thing that, um, Sorry about that information, but let me summarize. Okay, let me make things easier and simpler. So the first is why we need continuous integration. Okay, the reason being that uh, in the past, developers working in isolation, they work individually on a feature or on some code, and they push a lot of new code to the main branch at once. So this may cause issues. Right, because they haven't uh, checked bugs often, and the bugs or the issues may also accumulate. Okay, so the key of continuous integration is that we uh, integrate our code changes early and often. So when you are working on your group projects and also try to um, merge, uh, sorry, try to integrate your code changes early and often, early and often. Yeah, so that they can identify issues. Okay, so there's some. So, so this is why we need continuous integration. Okay, so to achieve continuous integration, so there are some tools to help us with that. So we do not need to manually put in a terminal npm run test each time we commit something. So we use some tools. So for example, the GitLab uh, CI tools to help us run those tests for, for us automatically for each commit, okay? So the, so first of all, why is it clear? And now is how. So this tool helps us to achieve uh, continuous integration. It helps us, okay? So within this tool, there are only two things that you need to concern about. One is the pipeline. And the pipeline looks like this. It's just uh, stages of work and some draws, and it helps you visualize everything. Okay, so this is the pipeline. Another one is the editor. So it's just an editor. <laughs> and this editor helps you check your syntax. Okay, and it also has a visual 
tick or pending or fails um, signal here. Okay, so this is how. That's it. <laughs> All good? Yeah, you, you will definitely understand better after the labs and the, the, the projects. Yeah, so this pipeline ran automatically for each commit. So, if, for example, uh, I add some SJS. Uh, I added something, for example, I console log x ray again. Okay, I add something in a file. Okay, and I commit. Okay, I commit the change, and you can see. Here is pending. It's a new pipeline here in progress because I updated this JS file because I committed that and it passed. Yeah. So does the script in each stage get excited in the terminal? What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, how script get excited? <laughs> cool. So you understand why we need continuous integration, and you understand how uh, the GitLab CI tool, the pipeline, or the editor helps us achieve the continuous integration. So that's all for this lecture. You, you only need to know this. Okay. Cool. Any questions? Yeah, I think the chat has been fine. Okay. Not for now. Cool. Uh, you're good. Perfect. Great. Um, yes, it's great that you are good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. So let's have a quick recap of, about first half, shall we? <laughs> uh, see if I've finished here. Oh, here are some further reading. Don't get overwhelmed. So this is the feedback form for the second lecture today. Okay, just give you a few seconds for the feedback. Okay, uh, while you are working on the feedback, uh, a quick recap about the first half of the lecture, like the data interchange formats. Um, so why we need to have a data interchange format is for communication between different software components. Okay, so maybe you have uh, components, so for example, front end writing JavaScript and you have back end writing in Python. So how can you transmit and communicate uh, from the frag and our backend. So we use some um, standard data interchange formats. Okay, just just an example like uh, communication between front and back and backend, but there are also different communications between software components. And we need to have an interchange format, a standard data interchange format. And the three format that we mentioned today are JSON, YAML, and XML. Okay, so JSON we have seen, so you do not need to know when you need to pick JSON or YAML or XML uh, for now, okay? 
you just have a you just need to have understanding well when we see json file or yaml file or xml file i know it's a way of storing data it's just a data format okay you only need to know that and the syntax is very uh, straightforward as well so you can also check your syntax from the tools that i showed you before okay do not need to worry too much about that So does the pipeline check just to check if our code works or not when we commit? Yes, it, it can. Yes, it can do the check. Yes. Same like data structure. It's not that complicated. It's just a way of storing data. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to post in the forum. Okay, I, I hope I haven't missed any question in the chat, but let me double check if there's any more questions. You can even make runners to commit a fix when it's linkage or uh, linked. Um, yeah, don't be overwhelmed. Like we will talk about links uh, later. Okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, otherwise, that's all for today. Um, I'm very happy to have my first lecture for Comp One Five Three One this time. Um, we'll see you more like i will see you more often uh in the future um including tomorrow uh if you can come on campus uh it will be great to see you in person and we can have a chat okay cool thank you thank you everyone thank you see you tomorrow Rob Pep, good question. Um, I think Rob is, uh, but I, I will make an announcement about that later, okay? But you'll still see me tomorrow. Yeah. Wednesday, yes. Bye.